Hello everyone and welcome to this London Art Week digital talk and thank you for joining us on a Saturday morning. My name is Emanuela Tarizzo and I'm gallery director at Tommaso Brothers Fine Art, which specializes in European sculpture and all master paintings. I am joined here today, virtually of course, by Dr. Adriano Imonino, who will be giving today's talk and I will be hosting the Q&A at the end. Adriano is Senior Lecturer and Director of Undergraduate Programs in the History of Art Department at Buckingham University. And he has created several exhibitions, including Drawn from the Antique, Artists and a Classical Ideal, which some of you may have seen at the Sir John Stone Museum in London or at Tyler's Museum in Harlem in 2015. He is currently working on several projects, including a book on the patronage of the First Duke and Duchess of Northumberland, a revised edition of Francis Haskell and Nicholas Penny's Taste in the Antique, a book on Pier Leone Gezzi's Studio di Monte Pietre, and a digital critical edition of Robert and James Adams's Grand Tour Letters and Writings. So first of all, thank you Adriano for joining us today. We're at such a busy schedule. Um, your main research interest is the reception of the classical tradition in the early modern period, which is arguably a very broad topic. As we all know, uh, Greek and Roman antiquities have been admired and copied by artists for centuries uh, for inspiration. Um, and at Tomasa Brothers, we explore this topic in our London Art Week exhibition, which uh, presents a selection of bronze and marble statues after ancient models, specifically models that are today in museums, as we wanted to pay homage to these uh, wonderful masterpieces that we haven't been able to see um, for such a long time. Um, today, Adriano is going to talk to us about how uh, these models have become so famous and so familiar and admired, and he's going to look at it from a specific point of view, uh, the point of view of the artist. So, Adriano, uh, without further ado. Perfect. Thank you very much, Manuela. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. You loud and clear. Perfect. So, as... Um, Manuela just mentioned, the subject of the reception of classical antiquity uh, in the early modern period and the impact that classical statues played on the development of early modern art, so from the 15th century to the 19th century, or in the period of the long renaissance, as I prefer to call it, is enormous, is a wide subject. And it could be considered, in a way, the subconscious as it were, of Western art, because even artists who actually denied uh, uh, any reference to classical antiquity, to classical statues, had to deal in one way or another with uh, a reference to the antique. This uh, crucial role assigned to uh, the antique, and especially to classical uh, statues, Roman and Greek uh, statues, full statues, full-size statues in the round, uh, um, the crucial role that was assigned to them has uh, many uh, different uh, reasons and they're complex and intertwined. First and foremost, prestige. Prestige of anything antique. Secondly, of course, the cultural and political references that could be uh, drawn to uh, figures from Greece and Rome, especially from the point of view of collectors and uh, and the rumors in the early modern period through a display of classical statuary in their villas, urban houses, etc. etc. But in my opinion, first and foremost, uh, this process of canonization and this uh, extremely important role, as role assigned to classical statuary is because they played a crucial role in the education of young artists and as a source of inspiration for artists throughout the period an absolutely crucial role in terms of pedagogical approach and in terms of inspiration and invention. So today I will be following in a way the point of view of the artist. So I will adopt a very long chronological span, a long durée approach from mainly from the 16th century to the 19th century, but from a very narrow point of view. So only the point of view of the artist. And at the same time, I will try to follow how the point of view of the artist helped in the process of canonization of a group of statues, more or less 150 statues 
uh, which were dug up from the soil of Rome and become, became step by step canonical, especially from the middle of the 16th century onwards. So a long chronological span, but a very narrow point of view. And at the same time, I will focus only on full size sculptures in the round, statues, especially in the nude, rather than uh, sarcophagi or reliefs, which could be the subject of a different, uh, uh, of a different uh, uh, paper. And especially we'll look at different approaches, at the different approaches that several artists had uh, uh, in terms of the study of classical statues. The type of information, the specific information that they were trying to gather from different models. And especially through the medium of drawing, because through the medium of drawing they could actually study composition, forms, expression, anatomy, proportion, etc., etc. So it's really the antique as a principle and guidance in through the medium of drawing in the education of young artists. So as a first slide, uh, I decided to compare and contrast them, as it were, two artists at the beginning of the phenomenon and at the end of the phenomenon. And at the end of the paper, I will discuss why at a certain point the reference to classical antiquity started to fade in the 19th century. So Pisanello in 1431 or Circle of and Turner in 1820. 400 years separate, uh, four centuries separate these two drawings, both of them obviously referring to the great force famous, great in terms of size, they're almost six meters tall, only the statue, the great force famous that can be still seen on the Quirinal Hill in Rome. And <clears throat> so, I chose to compare and contrast these two drawings because they are in a way at the beginning and at the end of this phenomenon of imitation of classical statuary, but also because there are two artists that usually we do not associate with the classical ideal or with the imitation of classical statues. Pisanello, a late Gothic artist operating in, uh, in Italy, Turner, of course, uh, the greatest probably British landscape painter and this is a drawing of 1820, so when he was already a mature artist. Already from uh, looking at these two drawings, you can see that actually each one of them, Pisanello and Turner, were trying to derive, to extract from the same piece of classical statuary, completely different type of information. Pisanello is really interested in anatomical hmm, information, in the forms of the nude body. And hence, uh, he uh, isolates uh, the single figure against a neutral background. This regards the horses and the second figure. And even the, the uh, piece of drapery uh, uh, falling from one of the arms of one of the two Dioscores is just a sketch, while actually hatching and cross-hatching of the pen and ink is really concentrated on the torso and on the rest of the anatomy. While Turner, of course, is just sketching the monument as a convenient reference to be reused in one of his compositions, maybe one of his Roman compositions. But before we actually uh, look uh, specifically at different type of drawings and hence different type of approaches from the 16th century onwards, I think we should take a step back very quickly uh, uh, consider what kind of statues uh, were available to artists uh, at a certain point. We tend to forget uh, that in the 14th, in the 15th century, so in the early Renaissance, uh, the uh, number of full-size sculpture in the round, uh, so full-size uh, statues, and especially nude uh, statues, were, uh, was very limited. You could count them on the fingertips of one of your hand, maybe two. Very little has survived from antiquity. The horse tamers, the Spinario, the Marcus Aurelius, the two great rivers from the Quirinal today on the Capitoline Hill, the Marforio, very little had survived. And uh, they had survived for different reasons. For instance, the Marcus Aurelius, as anyone know, had survived because already from late antiquity, uh, it had been, uh, the statue had been interpreted as a portrait of the Emperor Constantine, the first Christian emperor, and hence it was not melted down as all the other statues. So what had happened to uh, the thousands and thousands of statues that were, had been mentioned by Pliny, which dotted Rome and many other cities of the empire? So, um, Exactly, with the collapse of the Roman Empire, and especially in the 6th, 7th, and 8th centuries, so the central uh, 
centuries of the high middle ages uh, most of the, of the thousands of statues that dotted Rome and the Roman territory were literally destroyed were destroyed because of natural fall of huge buildings because of the floods of the river Tiber they were destroyed especially for economic purposes so marble statues were literally pulverized in order to obtain lime and bronze statues were melted in order to obtain uh, bronze, uh, coins, weapons, etc, etc. And probably also some of them were uh, uh, intentionally destroyed by Christian authorities, especially after the uh, edict of Theodosius in 380. So several reasons that actually uh, contributed to the uh, almost complete destruction of the heritage, the visual heritage of Greece and Rome in the central centuries of uh, the uh, High Middle Ages. So step by step from the uh, 1530s more or less, and certainly by the middle of the 16th century, a clear canon of a restricted number of classical statues started to emerge. Mm -hmm. uh, you can infer the uh, creation of a canon through the uh, replicas, replicas in marble, in bronze, in plaster, in different sizes, in print, in drawing, in quotations by antiquaries and travelers, but first and foremost because some of these statues actually became extremely important as models to be copied in the education of young artists as, as a source of inspiration for uh, uh, any sort of artist traveling to Rome. So the role of the artist in the process of canonization is absolutely crucial in this sense. So today I will follow in order to understand why, why these statues, uh, a selected number of statues became so canonical, so crucial in the education of young artists and as inspiration, I will follow only one example, the Lacon. But this is an exercise that I could do for, that anyone could do for many different models. So the Hercules Farnese, the Borghese Gladiator, the Apollo Belvedere, etc., etc. But I will actually focus only on one statue in order to see uh, the different approaches to a single piece of sculpture and the type of information that uh, artists were trying to extract from this single piece of sculpture. The Lacon, found in 1506 in Rome, was immediately associated with a famous passage in Pliny. By the middle of the 16th century, the Lacon had become, uh, in a way, the most important uh, image of sorrow from classical antiquity, the Imago Dolores. And everybody studied Lacon for many different reasons, but I will start by showing you, in a way, how artists looked at the Lacon as the archi archetypical image of, uh, of sorrow and pathos. But first, before actually looking at actual drawing, I'd like to show you a wonderful drawing by Federico Zucchero, which is actually a meta drawing. So it's a drawing on the, art, on the process of learning how to draw via the imitation of classical statuary. It's a drawing the, that uh, meditates on the process of learning how to create drawings in a way. And here Federico, who is of course the refounder of the Accademia di San Luca in Rome at the end of the 16th century. So this type of drawing, this is part of a series, have a clear uh, pedagogical uh, aim. Taddeo is shown under the scorching sun of midday, intent at copying the lacon only with some wine and some bread, uh, which of course is not touching because of course, already by the end of the 16th century, the artist was supposed, and this is a trope that actually is absolutely recurrent in all the theoretical literature of the 16th, 17th, and 18th century, the young artist actually has to forget almost completely the outside world and focus completely on classical antiquity in order to absorb as much as possible the information available in one piece of sculpture. Not surprisingly, on the background, you also have Le Camere di Raffaello, so Raffaello's stanze in the Vatican, as one of the most important, of course, uh, uh, one of the most important models to be copied, because by then, Raffaello uh, the new Apelles, the artist who had uh, uh, even surpassed the great master of classical antiquity, had achieved uh, a canonical statues very similar to that of classical antiquity itself. 
so now step by step just uh, i will show you some actual drawings after the antique i will show you what tadeo is sketching as it were sketching on his drawing board on a piece of paper the first one is a drawing by martin van hemsker drawings are all drawings from northern european artists and especially netherlands dutch and flemish because uh, in the 16th century most of the artists pouring into rome came from the netherlands not surprisingly and even before the foundation of uh, proper art academies uh, rome had become a sort of a sort of open air academy especially for artists who came to rome to round off their education from the northern states of Italy and the northern parts of Europe. So the next three slides are uh, focused on Netherlandish artists and then we will move on. This is a drawing that uh, of one of the sketchbooks by Martin van Hemskirk. He was in Rome in the 1530s and it filled uh, many pages, wonderful pages um, of sketchbooks which are now in Berlin with um, drawings after classical statues, details, uh, full statues etc etc and his sketchbooks are one of the most important documents visual documents on the condition of classical antiquity in rome in the 1530s and the stages of the collections of classical statues at that date however i chose this specific image because here hemskirk is really interested in a way in a study of expression rather than anything else he is isolating only the head of the Lacon, rendered very careful in pen and ink, which is a very precise medium. He is disregarding the rest of the body of the father of the Lacon group. This is a typical study of expression. So this is the type of information that he's trying to gather from this particular piece of sculpture. Completely different approach can be derived from uh, what are uh, probably the most widespread type of drawings produced by artists in the 16th century. Drawings interest in the composition of statues, in the overall aspect of classical statues. Sometimes these drawings are also preparatory drawings for prints, like in this case, Heinrich Holsius, Holsius one of the greatest uh, Dutch engravers of the 16th century came to Rome at the end of the 16th century and um, filled loose, beautiful loose sheets on uh, blue prepared paper with uh, very faithful copies of classical statues in view of a publication, in view of a translation into print, uh, something that could be easily marketed when back at home in the Netherlands. So these type of drawings are incredibly precise. They very often are static. The image is parallel, almost uh, invariably parallel to the picture plane, and very often they show a strong contour line. But in this case, the hatching and cross-hatching and also the uh, a, a very subtle use of black choke, which being a, more, a much more pliable medium, actually lends itself much more than pen and ink to the study of the tonal passages on the anatomy of classical statue and this is the medium that actually started to be preferred to pen and ink at least by the middle of the 16th century this type of very static compositional preparatory drawings very often resulted in actual prints of the hercules farnesus but many other artists starting from the middle of the 16th century produced a huge amount of prints of these canonical statues and through their prints in a way they contributed to the formation of a canon because these prints actually were uh, easy to transport relatively cheap and hence actually they scattered the knowledge of a canonical group of statues to the four corners of Europe. so they contributed to the formation of the canon but even more important from us they also entered the uh, teaching practices of workshops and curricula of academies because these prints were actually shown to young artists as a teaching tool at least from the late uh, 16th century onwards so that the young artists started by copying uh, what uh, uh, eyes noses ears 
So in a way, in a way, the single components of the human figure, what is called the ABC of drawing. And then step by step, they were supposed to move to the composition of the whole face. And then step by step, they were supposed to, to be able to design the overall, the whole human figure. And at that moment, when they masked the overall composition of the human figure, they were shown this kind of print so that from the beginning, they could learn the idealized proportion, anatomy, expression, the, the idealized structure of the human body rather than the uh, um, natural human body with all its uh, accidental imperfections, wrinkles, signs of age, etc., etc. And I will come back to this concept of idealization in a second. So also that step by step, they could learn how to transfer the two dimension of the print into the two dimension of drawing from same medium into a similar medium. And only after they had mastered the copy of a print or of a drawing, they were exposed to plaster cast. So they were exposed to the study of the third dimension, which is much more complex. So really, this is in a way the beginning of the ABC of learning based on the study, on the study of classical statue. If we move to the 17th century, to the beginning of the 17th century, we see that actually the approach to classical statuary, especially in genius artists like Rubens, changes drastically. Rubens arrived in Rome at the beginning of the 17th century, 10 years after Holtzius, but you see that his approach to the, to the Lacan and to many other classical statues was completely revolutionary. He completely emerged himself in the study of classical statues and he left even a, a, a theoretical treatise that was never published, was published only in the 18th century, called De Imitazione Statuarum, on the imitation of classical statues. And in this, he actually uh, uh, stresses the fact that young artists actually need to study the antique thoroughly to the point that actually they became so familiar with the antique that they don't even need to have the actual uh, statue in front of their eyes. However, and this is probably the most important aspect of his theoretical writing, he was very well aware of the danger of uncritical imitation of classical statues. And he was very well aware of the danger of transferring one medium called stone into a completely different medium, drawing or painting. And so he said that actually the role of every artist was to turn stone into flesh because those artists who actually remained trapped into the copy, into the imitation of classical statuary could produce works that smelled of stone. They could only in a way produce works that actually were in a way not original. They remained trapped uh, by the reference to classical antiquity. And this became a trope later on, repeated by Bernini, etc., etc. What you see in these two wonderful drawings uh, is uh, exactly what Rubens uh, uh, states in his theoretical writing. He's turning uh, stone into flesh. These two drawings actually look as if we are uh, uh, looking at a real human figure. What Rubens does, first and foremost, he completely abandons the static frontal point of view of the 16th century and adopts instead diagonal, oblique point of view in order to stress the dynamism, the pathos, the drama mm, of the statue. And in order to reuse this kind of, of uh, uh, points of view in his own composition, he's really interested in the anatomical details of the Lacan. So these can be considered anatomical drawings in reference to classical statuary. If you look at the way he uses black chalk, and he, if you look at the way he uses the hatching and cross hatching and even smudges uh, the, uh, uh, the medium of the black chalk with his fingertips or with bread uh, or with bread crumb, uh, you can see that actually all the focus is on the torso of the lacquer, both in this frontal view and in this back view. The coils of the snakes, the curls of the beard and the hair, the folds of the drapery are just sketched. Everything is really focused on the torso of the Lacan. This is the type of information that he's interested in, in the anatomical, in the superficial, in the skin anatomy of the Lacan. And he's literally turning stone into flesh by enhancing 
the anatomy of the Lacon. And he will reuse the Lacon, the Hercules Farnese, and many other statues throughout his career. And what is very interesting is that actually he was absolutely obsessed in a way with the copy of what we could define today Hellenistic statuary rather than classical statuary, because probably without any knowledge of the fact that they were Hellenistic rather than classical at the beginning of the 17th century, which is something that will be developed only later on, but probably he recognized in the drama, in the pathos, in the uh, uh, exas exacerbated musculature, in the dynamic poses of that type of statuary, something that was more familiar to his own aesthetic and to his own purposes. However, there is another approach to classical statuary, which in my opinion is the most important one and certainly became the obsession of academic circles, especially in France and in Italy, in the second half of the 17th century and throughout the 18th century. And this is the proportional study of classical statue. So, so far we've seen an interest in the expression, in the composition, in the anatomy of classical statues, and now we move on to material proportion. Many different literary sources surviving from classical antiquity handed down to the Renaissance and the Baroque and the classical period the knowledge that classical statues were based on a system of proportion resulting in overall harmonic perfection. But there is one passage which is much more important than any other passage which was available in the 16th, 17th, and 18th century, and is the famous first chapter of Book Three of Vitruvius de Architectura, where Vitruvius discusses the famous analogy between the well-proportioned temple and the homo bene figuratus, the well-shaped man. Hmm? And this is also the passage that served as the basis for Leonardo's Vitruvian man. And so Vitruvius says, proportion is the correspondence of the measures of all the parts of a work and of the whole configuration, could be also body, from which correspondence, commensurability is produced. By commensurability, he means measurability by a common standard, a module, by which all the rest, all the other uh, 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 elements of a work or all the other parts of the human body can be divided. So the measurability by a common standard that can be a digit, can be the phalanx of the middle finger, etc, etc. A typical one is the fact that uh, the head of a perfect body should be the one eight of the overall height, etc, etc, etc. And after listing all these different perfect relationship, this perfect ratio, in the well-proportioned man, Vitruvius concludes this, the ancient painters and statuaries strictly observed and thereby gained universal applause. So this single passage actually handed down that they literally incarnated a system of perfect ratios resulting in idealized proportions of the human body. And so, at least from the 15th century onwards, but this is a practice that then would become absolutely widespread by the late 16th century, artists started to measure classical statue in order to find this system of perfect proportion. <laughs> if we know by reading Armellini that already in the 1580s, all young artists actually went around Rome measuring classical statues and plaster cast, by the 1640s, this had become one of the main preoccupation of uh, several circles of artists, and especially the circle of French and Northern artists operating in Rome in the 1620s and 30s. Poussin, Duquesnois, Domenichino, Charles Serrard, who will be the first director of the French Academy in Rome in 1666, all those artists revolving around the uh, cultural circle of Cassiano del Pozzo and uh, Marquis Vincenzo Giustiniani. All of them, and especially Duquesnoy and Poussin, spent innumerable days and hours measuring carefully with the compass and with the caliper the proportions of the ancient statues. Charles Serrard is the first one who actually, or is the first set of surviving drawings of uh, 
carefully measured canonical statues, which are still surviving today, and they're called the Beaux-Arts in Paris. This was intended for publication, but eventually he never published this. Only 40 years later, Gerard Audran published the proportions of the human body measured on the most beautiful figures of antiquity. Published in 1683, this is one of the most important product of the classicistic doctrine of the Parisian and Roman academies at the end of the 17th century. That doctrine which will establish the foundation for the spread of classicism in the 18th century, resulting eventually in the affirmation of a so-called neoclassicist aesthetic. This manual became an absolute benchmark of, of in the education of young artists throughout Europe. And you can find Audran being used well into the 19th century, translated into innumerable languages, translated in English, etc., etc., reprinted many, many, many times. And in this sense, in a way, it becomes the cornerstone, the cornerstone of the academic approach towards classical antiquity. Because if you actually uh, showed the young artist a classical statue, carefully measured, you uh, obtain several different um, gains, especially from an academic point of view. First and foremost, a very practical one. They could learn how to represent the human body according to idealized proportion. And in this way, circumvent the errors of nature, the errors they could, that they could see in the living model. So by looking at the proportion of classical statues, uh, they could actually surpass nature and create something that was idealized and universal. So in this way, it was a shortcut towards the universe. The second gain was exactly to expose young artists already from a very young age to a beauty that actually was considered to be true beauty, beauty with a capital B, because it was based on rational, quantifiable principles, principles that were considered to be at that time universal, i.g. mathematics, and the third, and so easily replicable wherever you were in your own composition. And the third point is that all this had clear metaphysical implications, because if an artist puts in the world a work, a composition that is based on perfect proportion, he, and only he, and I will touch upon this, uh, uh, this point in a second, he, in a way, will put in the world something that actually resonates and is based on those same principles on which the harmony of the cosmos is based. So by creating something that actually resonates on the same harmony of the cosmos, the artist literally surpass nature's striving for that divine order which is infused in the divine creation of, uh, of the cosmos and then corrupted by matter in, in our world, in the microcosm. And these metaphysical implications emerge from many of the theoretical treatises and uh, a lot of contemporary literature, especially in the uh, 17th century. This type of uh, rational approach to beauty, intellectual approach to beauty, quantifiable, something that is completely alien to our contemporary subjective relative conception of beauty, not surprisingly shares a lot uh, with architecture, with the study of architecture, especially with the study of classical architecture. Proportional drawings of classical statues and proportional drawings of classical buildings, not surprisingly, shares also the same representation of techniques. As you can see from this uh, uh, plate, the Lacon is shown frontally, parallel to the picture plane. What is interesting is only the contour line, and hence structure, not optical values. The hatching and cross-hatching is used only to show volume, but there's no real indication of tonal passages. It's the structural information that is really what counts. And if you look at the frontispiece of Audran, this is even more explicit. The head of the Apollo Belvedere is dissected into its compositional uh, principle. It's dissected into noses, eyes, mouths. And each one of these uh, um, compositional elements is presented in plan, in elevation, and in section, and carefully measured, like you could do exactly the same for a capital, or for a frieze, or for an entablature. So exactly, it's interesting to show how this intellectual and rational approach to the human figure 
uh, is in constant dialogue with uh, the practice and learning of architecture and its representational te techniques. This is, in my opinion, the manifesto of classicism within the French and Italian academies, because it takes, in a way, it gathers together three different preoccupations of the academy. One, the ABC of drawing, because you see that this is, in a way, the starting plate, because you should start, of course, starting the nose, the eye, the mouth, etc., etc. And also, of course, the obsession with the study of proportions. ABC of drawing, uh, the count of canonical classical statues, and uh, the study of proportions, all together into one single plate. This architectural approach to the human figure, and especially this architectural approach of proportional study of classical statue, was explicitated in this wonderful uh, drawing by one of the great visionary architects, uh, French visionary architects of neoclassicism, who actually didn't build or absolutely anything, or almost anything, Jean-Jacques Lecoeur. This is the frontispiece of a, 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 a treatise on design and proportion, which was never published. Today is at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France in Paris. And on the frontispiece, you have the head of the Capitoline Antinus, which by the end of the 18th century had become the archetypical figure of embodying the perfect proportion. And the face of the Capitoline Antinus is literally dissected into its building blocks, uh, like a work of architecture, and is measured through rulers, set squares, calipers, compasses, the tools of the architect, and the tools of any artist studying classical statue from a proportional point of view. It's a wonderful proto-surrealistic image. In fact, it was absolutely loved by Duchamp, Picabia, etc, etc, etc. The role the classical statues uh, had uh, gained in the 17th and 18th century, in the late 17th and 18th century, within the academic uh, uh, circles, is perfectly represented in, in this image. So the crucial role that a canonical group of classical statues had gained by the end of the 17th century is visually expressed in this uh, rather dull print, uh, I should admit it, but extremely interesting from a theoretical point of view. This is a print by Nicolas Dorigny from a drawing by Carlo Maratti, produced around 1680, I think, and shows actually an academy of design, of drawing, because of course, through the medium of drawing, that since the time of Vasari had uh, achieved a semi-mythical status, through the medium of drawing, the young artist can learn the intellectual aspects of the discipline. And by learning the intellectual aspects of the discipline, he becomes, of course, a practitioner of an intellectual liberal, liberal art rather than a craftsman, which after all is one of the great obsessions, one of the great aspirations of Renaissance and Baroque artists. In fact, in front of you, you have an academy of artists which are presented as uh, 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 classical philosophers, very much reminiscent of the school of Athens by Rath. And what we are invited to do in this very programmatic image is to ascend literally from the rudiments, from the mechanical rudiments of, uh, of design to the loftiest spheres of artistic creation and artistic composition. So we see here a student of geometry, and we see here the master of perspective pointing at a table with perspectival drawings. And he, we see here the study of anatomy, and that with a beautiful écorché, similar to the tetron de l'écorché, but with modifications. And underneath each of these, you have an inscription that says, tanto que basti, enough to suffice. You have to learn this aspect of the discipline, enough to suffice to create something which is convincing from uh, uh, the point of view of the imitation of nature. But then on the background and higher up hmm, on this path of artistic learning and artistic creation, you have the Hercules Farnese and Alician or Lycian Apollo, very much reminiscent of the Apollo in the school of Athens, presiding over the Academy of Artists. And on top of the uh, Lycian Apollo, you have an inscription that this time says, non mai abbastanza, never enough. So the study of classical antiquity should be not only something that you should treasure 
that you should do at the beginning of your artistic career, but you should carry on studying classical antiquity, especially from a proportional point of view, throughout your career, because classical antiquity and its canonical statues by now have become an absolute canonical treasure trove of information on the idealized human body. By this time, and I'm about to conclude, I think I have one or two more slides. By this time, of course, the academic curriculum had, in a way, canonized not only a, a selected group of statues, but also the approach to classical statuary. And step by step, if classical statuary had been at the beginning an immense repertory of uh, invention, of inspiration, hmm? now, step by step, the academic curriculum becomes something uh, constraining, suffocating for young artists. Would not surprisingly, we start rebelling by the end of the 18th century. And the proportional approach to classical statuary is so persistent within the academic doctrine that it even conditions other approaches to the study of classical statuary. For instance, the anatomical one. If classical statues are based on a system of perfect proportion, hence their bones, their muscles, and their sinews are perfect as well. So rather than actually flaying and dissecting the real body, they started producing these absolutely paradoxical images of flayed and dissected marble statues. Also, these are sort of proto-surrealistic images. Starting from Erard at the end of the 17th century with, of course, the, skelet the skeleton of the Lacan to Julien Faux, a French <clears throat> anatomist in the middle of the 19th century, actually flayed literally the Lacan to something which is um, unexpected in a way and shows how uh, ubiquitous and how widespread was this reference to a set of canonical statues. This is a, a handbook for young Japanese artists published at the end of the 19th century and the author, Kiyo, copied for plate but transformed it into an ukiyo-e image in a way creating a sort of monster a beautiful monster which actually is represent the meeting between east and west in the study of the human figure incidentally and i will be quite brief on this you might have noticed that so far i showed you male figures rather than female figures this is because several for several reasons, but mainly because in many theoretical treatises, it was clearly stated that a young artist should be exposed to the male body, to the anatomy of the male body, rather than the anatomy of the female body. Because the anatomy of the male body, with its enhanced musculature, could provide much more anatomical information for young students, rather than the softer, rounder anatomy of the female body, to which young artists were exposed later on through the study of uh, the Venus de Medici, through the study of a female statue. And this is also the reason, in a way, that prevented uh, young women artists to be exposed to the study of the male figure because of social concerns, because of the law of the column. Young female artists could not copy the anatomy of a nude male statue because it was considered to be absolutely inappropriate. While, of course, the male students could copy both the, the male statues and the female statue, both the male like model and, in some cases, the female like model, obviously, for the patriarchal uh, 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 structure of early modern European society. This whole curriculum has become extremely codified, right? An artist in academies, this is a beautiful drawing by Bernie showing the antique academy at the Royal Academy, which is one of the last academies to be founded in 1768. Artists, for instance, in the Royal Academy, when they joined the Royal Academy, were supposed to copy plaster casts for one to five years. They were supposed to spend one to five years into the antique academy before being exposed to the live model into the live academy. So that by the time they reached the study of the live model, they were in a way capable of correcting nature through the eyes of culture, as it were. They were able to correct the imperfection of nature through the knowledge of the idealized form of antique statues. But by this time also all these uh, plaster casts have become in a way simulacra, very far removed in a way to, uh, from the originals in Rome. 
and now I'm really about to conclude. And so by uh, the late 18th century, this gigantic theoretical and, uh, and uh, pedagogical and aesthetical cathedral started to crumble with the antique at its center. And the antique started to be more and more criticized by mathematicians, by anatomists, by artists who actually were trying to find something completely different in the study of nature for many different reasons, many complex different reasons. The first one of the most important one is that by the end of the 18th century, the uh, awareness of the fact that these were Roman copies of original Greek statues had started to become more and more widespread. And so they understood that actually they were just looking at copies or modifications or complete invented creation produced in Roman workshop rather than at Greek originals. And also that, of course, uh, most likely their proportions were not so idealized as they had thought in the previous centuries. But most importantly, there was a huge shift in the way beauty was conceived and perceived and discussed. There was a huge aesthetical shift. And already by the middle of the 18th century, that intellectual, rational, quantifiable approach to beauty, which you can see on the left part of your screen, as perfectly, in a way, epitomized by Gerard Baudrin, as perfectly epitomized by the proportional approach to classical antiquity, has started to be attacked and discussed by those like David Hume, by those like Edmund Burke in his uh, treatise on the sublime and the beautiful, published in 1757, those who actually said, no, beauty is certainly not something that we experience and understand through the intellect. Beauty is something that we experience through the senses. Beauty, therefore, and this is the implication, is something that is subjective and it's relative. It's something that is filtered through the senses, that hits the emotions rather than the intellect. And not surprisingly, at the center of books of uh, Edmund Burke argument, there's a ferocious attack against uh, the conception of proportional beauty. And so I, I love to compare and contrast these two different approaches to the same classical figure. You have to the right a much more, in a way, proto-romantic, if you allow me this superficial generalization, this proto-romantic approach to the Lacan, a beautiful drawing by Fusley when he was already in London of a young courtesan clutching her fists in a moment of erotic rapture in front of the, of the torso of the Lacan. So a sensorial, hmm? in this case, sensuous hmm? approach even to classical statues. And so with the advent of Romanticism and then realism, the cathedral literally started to fall. Hmm? And if the copy of and the study of plaster casts of canonical ancient statues remained a benchmark of academic education well into the 20th century, until the, the 1960s, at least, the driving forces of European artistic creativity step by step started to abandon the reference to the classical ideal in search for a different approach to nature. And this is a wonderful example, in a way, of this new attitude by Thomas Couture, who is one of the great last uh, academic uh, painters trained in the classical tradition, one of the great academic painters of the 1850s and 60s. And this is a parody of the young realist painter following uh, in the footstep of Courbet, who actually has completely discharged the antique. He uses the head of probably the head of an Apollo as a, a stool, while actually on the plinth where before a statue, a model uh, of a classical statue would have been displayed, we have the head of a pig. And he's there sketching the head of a pig. So he's sketching nature as it is, not nature as it should be. And on the walls, instead of having heads and faces of classical statues, or feet of classical statues, now he has onions, cabbages, boots, etc, etc, etc. So literally the world has been turned upside down and now nature, reality, has taken in a way the uh, uh, predominance over idealized nature and classical beauty. 
And I conclude with this slide by saying that, uh, 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 nonetheless, many of the great masters of early modernism, Picasso, Braque, Matisse, etc., etc., most of them actually were trained in the standard academic curriculum by copying classical statues at the beginning. It is really only in the uh, 1960, when at that moment, uh, the reference to classical antiquity had been almost completely eroded. This army of plaster casting academies uh, lied uh, abandoned, dusty, because of course the reference to classical antiquity had become one of the thousands of references in the age of modernity and completely in a way irrelevant by the 1960. And by the 1960, they became in a way associated in a way with that constraining, suffocating curriculum of the academy, the use that the academy had uh, uh, done of uh, the wonderful variety of classical antiquity, that stifling, narrow approach, uh, uh, canonical narrow approach of the late 17th and 18th century European academy. And these are two wonderful examples of vandalism, which I think should be preserved forever as they are in the Academy of Brera in Milan, where the Lacon has been destroyed and defaced and has a hammer and sickle on his torso and the poor Arrotino on his plinth has a writing saying, not al potere, not to power. So by, of course, the 1970s, they had become, in a way, irrelevant hmm, to a point, a simulacre of uh, a system that was uh, 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 very remote uh, to the interest of avant-garde artists in the 1960s. And at the same time, they ended up embodying, in a way, a system of reactionary and, or at least, conservative academic culture. So by concluding, in a way, very quickly, we can say that I hope that I was able to show by uh, going through different approaches, the expressive, the compositional, the anatomic, the proportional, the proto-romantic, et cetera, et cetera. I was able to show how artists in their search for information on the human body constantly looked at classical antiquity and were constantly at the center of the codification of a canon of selected statues, 150, as I said, not only in the process of canonization of this canon of classical statues, also in the process of destruction of this canon. So I think that more than, uh, uh, than the collector, more than the, the, the antiquarian, who anyway played a crucial role in this process of can on canonization, we should really look at the point of view of European artists. Thank you, Adriano. Right, there you go. Um, we five minutes for a couple of questions. So why was the depiction of nudity uh, in reference to classical antiquity, which obviously I think is a subject maybe for another talk because it's to do with ancient Greek and Roman aesthetics, but if you want to say a few words. Um, and this nudity, was it to understand the human anatomy? And in what way can we say that losing these sculptures uh, caused the loss of immense knowledge? And so did it. And, and then referring to your slide with the three figures of statues uh, with measurements, um, the Venus, uh, the Locon, and I think the Antinous, uh, mm -hmm. what does M in measure stand for? Which I presume meter. What does, sorry? M in measure stand for? Go and ahead. how do we know the classical statues from which they were inspired were of ideal measure? Okay, the first question, I will not go into the ideal nude in Greek aesthetics, which is a, the subject of a different lecture, but let's say that early modern artists were interested in the uh, ideal nudity of classical statues. They were also interested in uh, female draped statues, but again, the study of drape or drapery is the subject of a different lecture, but Mostly they were interested, of course, in the uh, uh, heroic nudity of uh, this canonical sculpture because, of course, they could offer them information on the anatomy, the expression, the composition, and the proportions of the, of the human body. You have to remember that actually, although the practice of the copy of the live model uh, was absolutely widespread since the 15th century onwards, huh? think of the beautiful uh, drawings by Benozzo Gozzoli and his workshop, for instance, of Filippino Lippi, etc., etc. 
uh, it was in a way very difficult to keep a model in a dynamic position for a long period of time, first and foremost. Yes. So, plaster cast or prints, plaster cast started to be disseminated in artist workshop in the 16th century, really, although we have some examples, Benavides, we have some examples before, but they really become, in a way, the apostles of good taste, uh, as Diderot uh, mentioned them only in the 17th and 18th century, and also by moving the light condition, by uh, candlelight, this is why many uh, young students studied antique sculptures at candlelight. You could change completely huh, the tonal passages on the anatomy and so get a completely different set of information. One. And second, because in a way, uh, uh, very often the live model, exactly, especially from a classicistic perspective, uh, which starts to gain ground really from the middle of the 16th century with Ludovico Dolce with Armenini, with Lomazzo, even with Vasari, and then of course Pinoy, etc., etc. The live model, in a way, was copying nature as it is, not nature as it should be, not mm. nature uh, corrected, idealized according to perfect proportions, etc., etc. Which brings me to the second question, which is a very complex question, and I don't want to go into that because I think the public otherwise will commit suicide en masse. But mm. Stand for minutes, which is the standard uh, uh, modular unit which is used in proportional drawings, at least from the late 16th century onwards, and then standardized by Gerard and Audran. If you want, you can find the Audran book online on archive.com. And if you read the uh, introduction, there's also an English translation, he explains perfectly what kind of measurements he's used. The problem is this one. And I will just touch upon this very quickly. These statues, of course, didn't, uh, 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 were not based on a system of modular proportionality. We're not based on a system, on, a, on, on, on that type of proportion reported by Vitruvius for many different reasons. First of all, because they were Roman copies, so adapted, modified, sometimes even Roman creations, patchworks, right? Secondly, because that kind of proportional consistency, which might have been common in the fifth century before Christ, uh, a Pythagorean approach to beauty. And so what they did uh, already from those drawings by, by Erard, uh, and I will mention just this, rather than actually trying to find the modular, they started something which is called fractional proportionality. For instance, they took the head, they divided the head in through subsection. This of course generates irrational numbers rather than integer numbers of modular proportionality. That's it. I don't want to go into that, but this is in a way canonized even further classical statues because their proportions, rather than being empirically checked against Vitruvius and rather than being empirically checked against modular proportionality, became the standard model of proportion to be applied to artistic uh, creations. Of course. And lastly, I think it'd be interesting, obviously you told us about the later sort of um, late 18th century and early 19th century change in the approach to the classical sort of mm -hmm. ideal. But um, even before that, in, in the Renaissance and, and in the 17th century, who were the, were there artists and who were the artists who refused to sort of abide by this canon? And even in their case, obviously it was so, it, permeated uh, artistic learning so much that they must have been aware of it and would have been confronted with it, with it anyway. So I'm thinking obviously Caravaggio as is the mm. first example that comes to mind, but there's more. Yes, in a way this uh, uh, interest, let me know if you lose me. Yeah. His interest in, the, in, in a canonical <laughs> group of classical statues is really attached to the Roman Florentine tradition and then to the Parisian tradition. To a certain point because then the Academy of Paris and also the Academy of Rome went into different directions but let's say in the uh, classicistic periods of the Roman, Florentine and Parisian Academy certainly they are uh, the supporter of this aesthetic. Other places like Venice in the Netherlands etc etc of course <clears throat> there's a running to this uh, to this uh, uh, to this pedagogical 
system, especially when it becomes very codified in the 17th and 18th century, a case in point, uh, I could mention thousands, of course, uh, today I've decided to speak to a clear narrative in a way, is Michelangelo. Michelangelo, although absolutely imbued with the study of classical antiquity, famously said, according to Vasari, if we believe Vasari, and many other sources, eh, famously said that actually the artist should have the compass in his eyes rather than in his hand, because the eyes judges and the hand measures, meaning that in the study of classical antiquity and in the study of proportions, the artist should apply to artistic creation individual judgment, judicio, which is an absolute aesthetical category in a way, advocating the freedom of the artist in that sense. And Vasari carries on by saying that Michelangelo completely disregarded Vitruvius and made his figure nine, ten uh, head, heads tall. And what really counted for Michelangelo is that this individual figure was consistent with the overall composition. Uh, so the composition is not, in a way, uh, um, uh, um, addition of single figures, but the single figure need to be adapted to the overall composition. This is, of course, the, the point that you should have the compass in your eyes rather than in your hand, and the, uh, uh, and the uh, in a way, uh, proud advocation of the freedom of the artist Judizio becomes a trope again in the 17th and 18th century as well. Right, um, thank you. And thank I you. think we can wrap it up. Um, uh, we hope that you've enjoyed the talk and Adriano, thank you so much. It was brilliant. And um, as a sort of closing remark, I would just say um, that as part of London Art Week, we have another talk tomorrow at 4 p.m. Uh, on a completely different topic, demystifying the old master's market. Um, and we hope to see many of you there. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, Manuel. Bye-bye.